the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you love us with an everlasting love for the sake of Christ. Grant us your peace so that in times of this world's tribulations, we may always remember that your Son has overcome the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. first reading comes from the 16th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the di of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. And now we read responsively Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us. That your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let all the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. The second reading comes from the 21st chapter of the book of the Revelation. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. 
its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each of the gates made of a single pearl and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 16th chapter, beginning at the 23rd verse. Jesus said to his disciples, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say that you will ask the Father, um, I do, and I do not say to you that you will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me, you may have peace. 
in the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite the young and young at heart to attend to the children's message this morning. Wow, Luther, Bear, and Larry, what are you looking at? Oh, you're looking up at the tops of our stained glass windows that have an image of a cathedral and spires. Oh, that reminds you of the steeple on Zion's church. Oh, you know, that's a good idea. If you're visiting a city or town you haven't been in, I bet you could look up and maybe find a steeple and know that you could find a church there and people praying and worshiping God. Yeah, that's true. Oh, because you're wondering how Paul found the group praying outside the gate by the river. Well, maybe it was known in Paul's time that that's where that church was going to gather. Or maybe Paul was asking about where the faithful gathered for prayer. That's another way you can find out how to join other Christians in worship. And so while there's a way of looking up for steeples, I don't always, we are gonna have a word that technology, like the computer and I need another hand here, this little thing, sometimes you could look down into your phone and search for the nearest church or Christian community for times of worship and prayer. So there are many ways to come together with God's people. And we hear in Acts that the Holy Spirit led Paul to that group where many converted and came to worship Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But guess what? You could also tell people and invite them to join us here at church. Uh, you could even send them an email or text or refer them to our website or Facebook. Say thank you, Catherine, Minister of Technology. Uh, and so uh, we give thanks that the Spirit provides many means by which we know we can gather together in person and online as Christ's big family, the church, and worship and praise him and receive his peace. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have peace tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I want to begin the message today uh, by sharing from an article uh, that was published in a, a periodical from the Mennonite Central Committee uh, who provide relief throughout the world. And this particular article highlights ministry in the Ukraine 
uh, and of course, so many of our hearts and prayers uh, have been with the people in the Ukraine. And the article tells the story of a woman named Anna, who is the administrative coordinator for MCC in Ukraine. And uh, she uh, was somebody who was working in her area, supporting people fleeing from conflict in other parts of the Ukraine. But then she herself, late February, as fighting got close to where she was, was forced to evacuate to another city. Now, she is experiencing the other side of being a refugee. She says that even as prepared as her family was physically to flee their home, it's essentially impossible to be prepared emotionally for what it is like. She says, when I came to the church for the first time, I entered the building and I started to cry. I started to cry a lot and could not stop because I was feeling that I had lost something or was leaving something in the past. I understood that we are refugees now. We are far away from our home. It was only a few years ago that we were serving refugees from the east of Ukraine. We had refugees in our church and now I understand in this time, we are refugees somewhere. While her experience has been emotionally and spiritually taxing, she has found a great deal of meaning and hope by choosing to help others experiencing the same challenges. I cannot imagine that a week ago, I was a refugee and I just came here but in the last few days, I was able to welcome people who had just come from these hard places. And I can see how much fear and worry they have in their eyes. And I understand what they're feeling. And now I can invite them to the table and to be there and eat with them a warm meal and I tell them now they're in a safe place. Praise the Lord that we have friends around the world. So I try to be useful. I try to be helpful for the people who just arrived here. There are times, clearly for me this morning, uh, it is overwhelming to contemplate and enter into what the situation is in Ukraine. And yet, we all know that there is hardship enough for ourselves, trials, tribulations, in our own lives, in our own families, in our church family. It can really seem like it is one thing after another, and circumstances change. It's so poignant to hear Anna's story about one who was serving refugees in her hometown, becoming a refugee herself. And as much as she knew about it from one side, the other side was a source of grief and sorrow, and yet the recognition of the power of Christ with her, the church providing a place of refuge that she could continue to serve as a refugee herself, welcoming others to that place of safety and hospitality. And I think that for many of us, as we age and go through changes, some gradual and some sudden in our own lives, 
How do we struggle with the ones who've been strong and serving others when we find ourselves in need of help and assistance, things we used to do that we can't, or things that we were doing going about our lives and now a family member, a neighbor, is in need of our assistance in ways that change our daily life. And there is a grief to these transitions, but there is also a constant. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his peace is always with us. Let's take a little bit of a contextual look at the gospel lesson. Jesus speaks these words of ask and you shall receive, your joy shall be full. When he is at the last meal with them, when he is giving a discourse about what is to come, preparing them for his arrest, his suffering, and his death, his earthly departure from them. And he knows they're going to abandon him. He says, you will be scattered each to your own home and leave me alone. Maybe he could have said, well, that's it. But Jesus knows the weakness and need and the trial and tribulation coming for the disciples and says, I know how you're going to react and it's not good. And I love you and forgive you and my peace will be with you. You're going to let me go. I will not let you go. You will have struggles. I think sometimes that's where there's a lot of grief for us. We think everything is going to be fine when it is fine, when it's been going fine for days, weeks, or years. And then the first little trouble hits and more and more and more, and there's a drastic change. What do we do now? We realize that peace cannot be created by ourselves. Daniel Meadows writes the following. Generally speaking, when I think of peace, I think of circumstances. If I want peace, I need to fix things in my life. I need to address conflicts. I must plan for the future, but I will always find something to worry about. I will never find myself in a situation entirely free of stress, drama, pain, fear, or failure. True peace comes from embracing what is and not from ceaselessly striving to change everything around me to make my life more safe, secure, comfortable. Peace does not come from external circumstances. Christ did us a service by making that clear. But he does tell us that he will be with us. His message of peace also includes that the Holy Spirit has come and has never left. I will not abandon you as orphans. I will send you an advocate, the spirit of truth. Jesus is preparing a place for us and he will return to take us there. The father loves us just as he loves his son. Jesus speaks his peace to us. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, I have overcome 
the world. And Luther, on this passage, writes, Hence, Christ wishes to say here, you have now heard both what kind of joy the world will have and what kind of sorrow will be yours. Therefore, learn it and cleave to it when you meet and experience it, so that you may have patience and lay hold of true comfort in the midst of such suffering. Jesus loved the disciples in all their weakness, frailty, doubt, and despair, anxiety and anger, competitiveness and grief, and promised he would always be with them. The same holds true for us in all the messiness of our lives, in all the responses and all our ways of trying to control things, and all of our anxiousness and fear. Oh yes, I think I got a fortune cookie this week that said something like, it's not just that there's change in life, but life is change. And yep, we wanna stop some of it, we wanna control some of it, but the good news for us today is that we always have peace in the midst of the swirling storms around us. That through his death on the cross and his victorious resurrection, the big stuff has been taken care of. We are forgiven and reconciled to our Father we have assurance of life to come and life with our Lord here and now. But we also hear the hard truth that until he comes again, there will be challenges, struggles, and sorrows. What difference would it make if instead of simply trying to change it or fix it or be sad about it, we get on our knees and give thanks for Christ's presence in the midst of it, the presence of sisters and brothers in the Lord journeying alongside us, that wow, we have a new opportunity like Anna to serve even in the midst of our own struggles. And yes, I think things feel much more compounded with world situation and COVID and, all right, I wasn't going to say it, monkeypox, whatever is going to cause the next anxiety in, in your life. And we are so aware of people grieving the deaths of loved ones, walking with those in hospice care, those who are seriously ill, those who need our assistance in ways that disrupts our lives. But is it a disruption or is it a holy call to service that we may share and be an agent of comfort and peace from the one whose peace is with us always? And may the peace of Christ which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.